Um, it's funny because this is always traditionally called the graveyard shift. First thing after lunch. Um, now I know why, because there's nothing technical in my presentation whatsoever, you'll be pleased to know. No calculations or anything. So, um, And the other thing is I have a terrible habit of leaning on the lectern. And after this morning's presentation, I'm more about a Dell boy now, where you lean on it and it disappears completely. So, um, so this really is about the new standards. And just to give you some background and a little bit of information about what's happening. Um, and where it's all going. So, um, hopefully, people know about the introduction of ENH120. If not, um, I suggest you very, very quickly find out. In 1998, um, at the last revision of ENH81's part one and two, it was decided that for several reasons, EN81-1 uh, and EN81-2 had come to the end of their useful life. Now when we say that, we know that that's because it will take at least 10 years to produce a new standard. And in that intervening period, things are going to rapidly change in terms of technology and in terms of uh, performance, etc. At the same time, um, as this new technology, um, things like MRL was being introduced, PASRAL being introduced, it was also a case where there were quite a number of what we call T2 comments, comments which were made against the EM81 1 and 2 at final vote, which are not allowed to be incorporated in the standards. When you actually put a standard out for the very last time, the final round of voting, people have to just vote yes or no. They can make technical comment, but the technical comment cannot then be included in the standard. And that's pretty obvious because otherwise the people who have voted yes suddenly find themselves with the standard when it's finally published with technical changes in it. So they've not actually said yes to that final version. So that's the reason T2 comments can't be done. They have to be looked at the next time around. Um, also, we've had a lot of changes in, in EU directives. And EN81 part one and two are primarily there for satisfying EU legislation. Another big change um, has been the predominant changes within controller technology. So now we have uh, a series of standards, the 60204, which pretty much cover everything that we would have already had about controllers in our documents. So now it's time to remove from our lift standards all those things that were previously controller technology related and say, somebody else has already done a standard there, we don't have to repeat it. We don't have to tell you about the design of a contactor. It's already there, it's in another standard somewhere. <coughs> and finally, the one that's always terrible for the committee guys to, to look at is the results of accidents. Uh, every time there is an accident, it usually comes into working group one, and we look at perhaps why that accident occurred, what we could do in the future to make sure if it's possible from a code perspective that it doesn't happen again. So some of the new um, introductions are as a result of fatalities or, or other serious injuries. When we look at changing EN81 1 and 2, we've got to do it on a very careful basis. What is not apparent to a lot of people who even sit in Europe and work on this all the while is how widely used those standards are in the world. So this is a map, um, unfortunately the colours have not come out very well, it's no disrespect to America, or I can assure that, that America seems to have disappeared, so, um, maybe, maybe, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but as you can see, America uh, still is working to its A17 codes, quite rightly so, they were developed uh, since the... Um, say 1920s or in a similar sort of time frame to the European codes. And whilst they're, um, they're separate, the level of safety that they provide is, is very, very comparable to, to what's in EN81. So um, everybody else uh, slowly has either adopted um, EN81 1 and 2 or with changes. I mean, if, you, if we take Beijing, anybody know how many lifts are being installed this year in China? Getting close, 500,000. Their own press people say 650,000, but their own government say no, it's about 500,000. So, um, 
And all of those are actually based on a variant of VN81 1 and 2. Um, not exactly, because they change a few things in accordance with their local government rules or whatever, but the majority is. So when we decide to make these changes, we have to do it now at a global level. We have to invite everybody else to make a uh, comment. And one of the things is, this time, a uh, comment was invited from this whole area uh, and also from South Africa. Um, we, we had comment from, from India as well, so it, it's been a, a huge change in terms of the way that we've looked at the development of standards. <coughs> so EN 8120 in future will be an amalgamation of what's in EN 81 parts 1 and 2 at present. It will cover both traction and hydraulic lifts all in a single document. The purpose is to try and remove a lot of the duplication. If you looked at part 1 and part 2, they both describe a set of lift landing doors. There's not much point in that. We might as well just do it once, and then if we need to change a document, we only have one document to change, not two documents every time. EN 8150 is more for the inspection industry and the certification industry. It will cover all of the requirements for type testing. So when we talked about buffer testing this morning, all of the buffer tests are described within that document. I have to say, oops, sorry. That's the one that hasn't really changed too much. There is very, very little change to the safety components in terms of, of what you would recognise them as today. When we look at who's involved in it, um, it's, it's enormous. It's a, it's a huge task. Um, we look at, as I say, the existing tests. We look at interpretations. Uh, all the different comments from various industry um, uh, lobby groups, if you like. Uh, the SEN consultant is a very important guy. He's the one who finally says, yes, this standard's fit for publication. Um, changes in legislation. Um, and as I say, for the first time, these uh, international interest groups, so North America, Asia Pacific, uh, have all been invited to, to make comment this time. <coughs> so what are the changes? If we go through some of them, um, and I can tell you, I've got another presentation due in a few weeks where we're going to take the entire day to go through what the changes are. So, <laughs> so this, by necessity, is very, very brief. Um, one, we well, had a presentation about the, the changes in ventilation. It's been decided that we will remove the well ventilation from the standard for all the reasons that were said in that very excellent presentation yesterday morning. Um, because it's now become a worldwide standard, you have to look at it from that perspective. And the ambient temperatures around the world obviously are completely different in terms of the, the environments that we find ourselves in. And so it's been decided that that really should be now being left to the building designer. Strength of materials has been changed. There's been a lot of uh, work done. Um, so now the standard describes pretty much uh, a casual force of somebody just placing their hand on something as being 300 newtons and an impact force of somebody falling against a, a component as being 1,000 newtons. At the same time, things like glass wells have changed because we've had accidents involving people dropping tools in glass wells. So whereas previously we only required um, laminated glass up to the height where people are present, we now require it through the full height of the well. So these are things that have changed regarding the material strengths. Another one from an accident in France, but where lift cars are not required to have balustrades, so a person could easily step off of the car, um, then to protect from falling, there must be no ledges in the well greater than 150 millimeters in the well structure. Now, that is already part of the, the A17 code, um, but it means that what we're trying to do is prevent people from just casually stepping off the lift car and onto the surrounding structure with the risk then um, that they're going to fall. Uh, window cleaners is the, is the classic, but maintenance engineers are just as likely to do it. The option to use solid piers under counterweights has been removed. So this was always a means of protecting them from falling counterweight. We all know it's, it's almost impossible to calculate the impact force of a falling counterweight. You have to first of all decide what distance it's going to stop in to be able to work out what the impact of energy is. So uh, rather than carry on with these protracted arguments, it's, it's decided to be deleted. 
Equally, for a long time we've been accepting that if you have a pit deeper than 2.5 metres, we say, well, it would be good if you had an access door into it, but we never made it a permanent rule. We said, well, if you can't because it's difficult, then it's okay to go down by a ladder. Now we've said, no, we're not going to allow that anymore. If you have a pit deeper than 2.5 metres, you must have a means of permanent access that is not by, by ladder. So it means, um, again, an architectural change to the building design. Counterweight screens are redefined in strength to prevent access from behind. We've always said you, you, um, you prevent casual access from in front of the screen. What happens if you move the counterweight from away from the wall? It's always been missing from our code, so now that's been completed. And another new introduction is that they must have a label indicating the design clearance under the buffers to ensure correct adjustment and re-roping in the future. What is the point of having very strict tolerances regarding headroom and the clearances in headroom <coughs> when you can then come along in three, four years time, re-rope the lift and destroy all those headroom clearances. Pits are to be fitted with inspection control stations. That's a very new one. Um, this because we all know uh, if you are maintaining a safety gear, then there is no practical way of doing that unless you end up with a lift which is being brought down towards the person who is stood in the pit. So at the minute it's being done dangerously and we want to try and put some control back in that in the future. So every lift in future will have a similar control station to that found on the roof of the lift car. Massive one, refuge spaces above and below the car have been rede uh, redefined. So all the refuge space sizes have increased. There's been a huge amount of study gone into doing that. Always in the past we've had what I always call survival of the fittest. There is one refuge space for one person and yet we allow two people to work on the roof of the lift. So I'm a big guy, I'm going to push the little guy out of the way and I'm going to find my way into the refuge space. In future there must be a refuge space for every person that is declared to be possible working on the roof. So if you design the roof for two people to be working there, you have to have two refuge spaces. They must be of the same size and the same type. And there are three possibles. Um, what is classed as a, a laying, a crouching, and what's now been, it, it's changed from the, the document I, I put out. It said standing, it's been changed to upright because it's been pointed out to us by the Chinese that you are standing on two feet when you're in a crouching position. So, okay, let's call it something else. We've called it upright, so. Um, the importance of all the refuge spaces being the same because you have to put a label on saying um, what that refuge space is to enable a person to adopt the correct position. Um, and what you don't want is you've got two different refuge spaces with two people, who's gonna stand and who's gonna crouch. So they've got to be of the same. Lighting requirements pretty much remain the same as they have in EN 81 1 and 2. There are one or two exceptions. Uh, the ambient light of the scenic lift well is no longer allowed. So where we said before, you don't need to put lights in the well because you've got a glass well and you can use ambient lighting for outside, has been shown to be literally useless. Um, when you move into the winter months, then if somebody who goes away, turns all the lights off, poor engineer's suddenly left in the dark. He's got to have control of his own environment. So, um, so that's one. Um, we have now added an emergency light on the car roof and we've increased the, the levels in the pulley room. When we get to the machinery spaces, um, there have been some changes, not too many, uh, mainly done to reflect the state of the art. Um, <coughs> one is increased in, in, in working heights because Generally, building regulations now around the world call for 2.1 instead of 2 metres as, as in terms of, uh, of clear height. Working areas, um, if you have a working area on the car roof and use blocking devices to, to fix the position while you're working on it, then what we said is there must be a way of, of uh, an engineer being able to exit from the roof of the car. So whether it's by a, 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 an emergency door or whether it's between clearances over the, uh, the landing of the car door, there, is, there has to be some permanent means of exit. A controversial one, sprinklers are now allowed in the well. Um, some building regulations have already sort of said all building spaces must have sprinklers fitted. What we've tried to do is recognise that by saying, okay, if you've got a sprinkler, then first of all, 
you have to, it's got to be an intelligent system. Before it's allowed to discharge, it's got to send the lift to the ground floor or the main exit floor, park with the doors open, and then you can discharge the sprinkler. Now, we're not even sure whether that technology exists at the minute. So again, it's going to be a challenge for the fire people to, to look at that and uh, determine whether that's a, uh, a practical solution. Access to working areas is now allowed via private premises. I don't agree, but I'm only the convener. Um, it's one I've never agreed with. Um, we don't allow it in the normally in the United Kingdom, but we now say it will be allowed, um, but it will be contingent on the provision of access for maintenance and rescue, maybe by uh, key holders or um, whatever is necessary to be able to do that. We also admit though that it can be subject to national regulation. There are some countries who have already said, um, the Netherlands being one, we will not allow this in the Netherlands. We will refuse to accept that you can have uh, a safe means of access through a private premises. <coughs> Regarding entrances, um, these have been now been grouped together. So the car and the, uh, the landing doors um, have all been classed into a, a, a chapter on entrances. They've been increased in strength. Um, we had a serious fatality in the United Kingdom where two people died falling through the lift doors. Uh, it's led to an increase throughout the, uh, Europe on the, the strength of, of doors. All doors in future will have to be pendulum tested, whether they're made from glass or steel. All power doors have to be fitted with non-contact protection devices, which will enable the detection of a person. So like EN8170 at the minute, um, it detects that a person is present. If the device fails to detect a person, then the lift must remove itself from service. So they've got to be self-checking. Glass doors will be provided with um, more protection. One of those is uh, looking at the reduced clearances over the lifetime of the doors, and another is the limitation of opening force. So it's always in the opening direction that the risk occurs, so now there is uh, to be a requirement to limit the force in the opening direction. New limitations on the height of the unlocking mechanism, specifically really for China. There have been 10 fatalities in China of persons falling into the lift well while unlocking lift landing doors <coughs> due to the height of the unlocking mechanism. So now we restrict the height of the unlocking mechanism to where everybody can easily reach it. All car doors are to be fitted with a restrictor which prevents opening from the inside by more than 50 millimetres when outside the unlocking zone. Now that's not as a replacement for car door locks. Um, this is a simple device which would be in addition to car door locks if you are in a, a dangerous environment where you have large clearances in front of the, the, the car doors. As far as the lift car, um, we've redefined the, the floor area slightly to include the area between the uprights and the entrances uh, to bring consistency with the ISO 4190 dimensions. Materials used inside the car, again, are subject to increased ratings of fire classification. So it will mean um, that the car materials will have to have uh, a certain degree of um, fire resistance in future. Also, the lighting levels have been increased to 100 lux from the 50 lux that they are at the moment, and that really is uh, as a result of um, a lot of discussion within the disability groups. <coughs> Requirements concerning loading devices, there's been a lot of talk about goods lifts and whether they're suitable or not. Um, in terms of how they're described in the standard. In future, if you're using a loading device that goes into the car and travels with the car, it must be part of the capacity of the lift. If it does not travel with the lift car, you must display a sign clearly on the outside of the lift which gives you the weight, the maximum weight, that the system is designed to handle for that, uh, that, that device. So if you're using a forklift truck, you've got to state what that weight is, the maximum weight that you've designed the system for. Because it's recognised that um, uncontrolled movement, re-leveling, has got to be capable of operating um, with that increased load, or you need chock devices or whatever to, to hold the weight of the, the device. New requirements for the strength of the car apron uh, and the car roof balustrade and all roofs must now be provided with a tow board. So that's even if there is no balustrade, there has to be a tow board around it for protection of things falling off the roof of the car during maintenance. 
For suspension systems, no big changes. We decided um, this will be part of a revision in the future. It will be the first revision. People are already starting to look at it now, but it won't include belts. It won't include the different rope technologies that are available at the moment. Terminations are, however, described in the standard. One of those is that rope grips are no longer allowed. Traction calculations have been corrected and the examples simplified. So a recognition that the examples that were in there were hugely complicated and we've given now a very normal calculation. Rope safety factors have also been amended to reflect changes in manufacturing technology. Now, it's because the original rope safety factors were based on uh, unhardened sheaves. And it's been recognised that now, because all manufacturers are using hardened sheaves, some of those safety factors need to be amended slightly. It won't make a big difference, but it might at the very limit of where ropes are being used in certain sizes. Safety components. Um, a decision was consciously made not to make any sweeping changes to safety components. It's because when we even started to discuss it, three European countries went to the Commission and said they're talking about making changes to safety components, stop them doing that. Safety components are fine, um, nobody's having a great deal of accidents and therefore please don't make any changes, so we haven't. We've altered one or two things. One, the safety gear must trip within 250 millimetres of downwards movement of the car. That is to try to prevent um, safety gears from missing the first tripping point of a governor and then increasing in speed to where they may be in excess of the capacity of the safety gear. So it will make a difference to people's designs of speed governors. The limit of 6G, I'm not going to go into, Nick's already covered all that this morning, um, but we have put a limit on the, the peak um, deceleration. And the type testing of the UCM, um, the uncontrolled movement, can now be done at component level to allow manufacturers to declare individual components in compliance. The electrical installation has had a massive overhaul. I'm not going to go into any detail because I'm running out of time, but um, it's uh, very big. You might have removed five paragraphs with one line now to say um, follow 60204 dash one, clause XYZ. And when you go into clause XYZ, that's now 30 pages. So it looks like we've simplified the standard. We haven't at all. We've actually made it far more complicated. But what we are saying is follow the standards which are already written for the controller technology. Other areas have been added, um, such as a requirement for RCD protection, protection from heat emitting components, and um, other EN standards for basic electrical protection and the design and use of, um, of uh, con uh, contactors. The control stations have been amended. They now have the requirements for the individual button markings, um, similar to pendant controls, so it's, and the common button has been added um, so that this will now be a uniform design across Europe. New requirements for protection and maintenance operations, um, which will include car door bypass on all lifts now in the future as well. Uh, and also a requirement to reduce the speed under inspection control when you are less than two metres clearance. So whether you are two metres from the pit or two metres from the headroom, um, you, you drop down in speed. That's really the major changes. Um, there are hundreds others. I mean, like I said, I can't even attempt to go into it, but um, just to show you how complicated the task is, when we put it out for comment, I didn't anticipate that we would get 4,200 comments. It's taken nearly two years to resolve the comments. We've had to ask for an extra nine months, the maximum amount of time. Um, when they were all resolved, we, we cut down 4,200 into 2,500 for an 8120. That, I believe, still stands as a record for the most comments ever received against a standard at the Senate. So whether that's a good record or a bad record, I'm not quite sure. Um, I think it's good, because I think it shows the general interest worldwide in these standards today. And finally, um, how will it all end up? Well. Yesterday, one of the reasons I disappeared, unfortunately, yesterday afternoon, was to find the news that we have uh, had a vote which now agrees 
that the final texts are suitable to send for final vote. So all of the European nations' votes are in. Only one nation said no. I'm not going to say which one. Um, but uh, it will now move forward for publication. Um, the final thing is to get the approval of the SEND consultant, which will happen over the next few months. And the publication really can be expected now sometime probably in September 2014. From that period, all of the national standards bodies in Europe have asked for the maximum transition period of 36 months. So three years to actually change product from the existing EN81 to the EN81-2050 standards. So you will have EN81-1 and Part 20 um, running in coexistence for three years, and then after the uh, 2017 deadline date, EN81-1 and 2 will be withdrawn finally and cease to exist as a, as a standard anymore. So it's been a huge job. Um, thankfully, we're nearing the end of it. Um, and of course, the date I'm looking forward to is that one there, because maybe then I can resign. <laughs> uh, it's been it's been an incredible job, and um, I can tell you that there's been more than 400 experts which have participated in the uh, in the change to these standards. So. so that's it. That's all I have to say. Probably overrun by a few minutes as usual. Never been known for saying least. So. Well, thank thank you.